Recording from the gateway to the Rocky Mountains, this is the Titan Applicators Podcast, where we dive deep into conversations centered around spray polyurethane foam and specialty coatings. I am your host, Tony Bach. In today's episode, I sat down with a spray foam industry veteran of 44 years, Mr. John Becker. John is founder and president of Spray Tech Systems out of Longmont, Colorado. You'll hear John refer to chemists as nerds, but they helped him advance his career. You'll hear him tell a story about how army officers got foam all over their uniforms. You'll even find out why you shouldn't spray foam when high on cocaine. The conversation was fun and lighthearted, but most importantly, it was informative. If you like what you hear, please give us a like, leave us a review, or even hit that share button. I hope you enjoy listening to John as much as I enjoyed speaking with him. John, thanks so much for joining us on the on the podcast. Um, for those listeners that don't know who you are why don't you give them a little rundown how how the heck did you get into the foam business uh yeah my name's john becker and um i got into the foam business in 1976 Uh, my brother and another guy uh, the other guy was a salesman for cook paint and varnish who made and distributed foam he was their salesman uh, you always got to be careful of those guys. Um, and he talked my brother into it, and I was out of work at the time, so my brother talked me into it and said, oh, you'll be good at this. I, I was 26 and had nothing going on, so which gave me a lot of time, and there was quite a learning curve, and it took us a while to get into it. So that's that's how I got started, and it was pretty much seat of the pants and had to figure out how this was working and how what was going on. So I learned like that. I went to the uh, uh, manufacturer, and I would hang out with the chemists because I wanted to know how it worked, why it worked, you know, which would tell me what I'm supposed to do with it. And I wanted to get as much stuff, as much information in me as possible, especially before I went out in the field. Anyway, so that's pretty much it. In uh, 1980, uh, we moved to Colorado. And um, uh, during that the startup and everything else we kind of did a little, little bit of everything everybody has great ideas for foam um, um, and then they just need a reality check of how it goes and where it's you know what's a good application and some things are and some things aren't and I met these people, you know and they just oh foam would be great for this and I go mm, no uh, it isn't you don't want to do that. And I said, but it's really good for this over here. You could use it for that. You could use it for your barn, you know, to keep your horses warm. Anyway, so that's kind of the basis of it. And I'd do anything that kind of came along. So in the late 70s, how how uh, how open were chemists to allowing you to come in and check out their process and to, to relay that? These guys were pretty good. Um, they were chemists, so they were nerds, you know, and... Um, they liked doing their work, and so they were happy when somebody came and asked them to talk about it, um, you know, more than just uh, doing it themselves or, you know, a, um, you know, formulating. And But they were, you know, I have found that most people, especially if you speak person to person, you know, and talk with them, and, and if you ask um, in a pleasant way, most people are pretty open most of the time and um, are willing to talk about things. So and that's you, the best way to learn. Yeah, you know, totally. I absolutely agree. Um, and and for how technical of a process spray foam is, chemis- is chemistry is where it all starts. Um, what would you say would were the, 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 uh, the biggest key points that you learned from 
from the scientists, from the chemists? Uh, <clears throat> this cook paint and varnish, um, they had had some, in its generic form, foam is very flammable. And these guys had had some major fires. And so their kind of thought on it was, well, we make foam, but please don't buy it. <laughs> and if you do buy it, for God's sake, don't use it anywhere because it'll be a big fire and we'll get named in a lawsuit. You know, great for sales. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, they had. Uh, and so the other side of that was that they put fire retardant in it. And at the time, the fire retardant was Tris, which was what they'd use in uh, kids' pajamas and things like that. That was the fire retardant they used. Anyway, um, oh, and by the way, it was carcinogenic, and um, uh, it, w it would make the foam very friable, which means that it's, uh, you know, urethanes, oh, God, um, Let's just back up a little bit. There's two basic kinds of two-component material. We'll call it plural component. Uh, you have your epoxies and then urethanes. And epoxies are very hard, very b brittle, very tough. Um, urethanes tend to be flexible, um, very malleable. You can formulate it in so many different ways. Um, I ended up with the urethanes and um, very interesting product. So, um, you've previously told me a story about when you first you first got into the foam business, uh, and uh, I think it involved diesel and your lines. Oh, so. We didn't know anything about it. We had this salesman. He, he was my brother and this salesman from Cook, Paint, and Varnish. He got us a rig that had belonged to this other guy who was a really fly-by-night um, foamer. And he had a step van. It had a um, 100 CFM compressor in it, a tow-behind compressor, which only got a little bit hot in the summer. <laughs> oh, it'd just kill you and a generator and so it was all self-contained it was a great rig uh and and we got into that the um and that's how we had to learn it you know that's how we got into the uh learning the business which is you know on one hand it was good because it was set up on the other hand it wasn't very good because it had been used and he hadn't taken great care of it and foam is a very critical material. Um, you really got to respect it. Um, I mean, it can act up, and, and um, you've got to know. That's why I hung out with the chemists, because it's an instant reaction. You know, when you're spraying this stuff on whatever, and it goes on, and it's liquid, and then in about eight seconds, it rises, and it's hard. It's very fast. Um and so if you don't get it right the first time, you're pretty well sunk. And it takes quite a bit of practice to, uh, to get it right, you know, as you're spraying it. Was, was there any support at that time as far as, as, far as equipment is concerned? Or well, the salesman, the salesman we had, oh, Jim checked in about 280, 300 pounds. <laughs> He was a big boy, and he didn't know. He was a salesman. He didn't know anything about it. But I would go down to this cook paint and varnish and hang out with the chemists because they did know about it. Um, and that's what I wanted to know. I wanted to hear the inside stories. Uh, at the time, the Alaskan pipeline was going on. This is a while ago. And they were making these, like, egg crates um, and what they would do, and these were six by six with a, like, egg crate configuration to them. And um, they were making these things. They had a, I don't know, a kernel and maybe a general or something. 
in there from the army. They were trying to sell them to the army. And so they pour the foam into the mold and they clamp it down. Well, one of the big sayings that we always had was never underestimate the power of rising foam. And this thing blew up and it all squirted out the edges and covered these Air, these army guys right at knee level <laughs> um, so it was little stories that like that that taught me a lot oh I, I can only imagine so you said you started in 1976 yeah. 44 years in the business wow how, how much how much has the equipment changed uh, when we started it was a little air powered machine that would put out 12 pounds a minute when it was running right um, uh, it was it had an electrical panel you know the mainly what you need with foam is you've got transfer pumps which feed the machine under pressure so it doesn't have to uh, suck suck it out of the drums so you need transfer pumps to feed the machine under pressure and then it goes through some filters and then it goes into a heater and then it goes into these pumps and the pumps take it from um, regular pressure up to mm, well this machine was about a thousand pounds so you'd have a thousand pounds of pressure going in from that point it pushes it down the hose and the hose has a heater on it it has a copper band that goes around the outside and heats the material the problem with the foam is it's very viscous and it's thick um the the resin part of it oh when it gets cold it can it turns to honey and um so you've got to you've got to have it heated because everything with foam is about mix you want to get the mix right and everything with our industry is one to one so it has part of the isocyanate which is the hardener and then the other part is the resin and the whole point is to get it to flow properly so the hose has to be heated and um uh Anyway, so in the winter time, we run into problems. Right. A lot of that has been cured these days. Um, the heaters are bigger. The the hose has better. Uh, and the other thing with it is that um, what the heat usually does, the, the reason for the heat is to lower the viscosity so that it flows easily. And a lot of people, the tendency, the logic of it, says that uh, because foam is a heat reaction and you get out on a, a cold job and logic will tell you turn the heat up and that's not the best thing because what that'll do is it'll thin it out too much and then your pattern goes off and where you started with a round pattern and they did figure out early on in the business that it was better to have a round pattern than a fan like a spray gun like a paint, paint spray. gun um so uh anyway you don't you don't turn it up um because it'll destroy the pattern and then you you get lines on the outside and you know when it's working right that's yeah, a beautiful thing well and for those listening um john obviously offers a unique perspective just because of his tenure in the business um but furthermore just as i've gotten to know john i've come to find out that he's he hasn't he hasn't been scared to venture off into, into unique, uh, projects. Um, you, you were primarily a roofer, right, John? Well, that's where the money is, you know, in roofing. <laughs> Insulation, you did some as well? Yeah, and I, when I moved to Colorado, oh, you always do insulation. Well, it's the best, best insulator there is. It's uh, one inch of foam does more than, you know, three inches of fiberglass. Plus, you can blow through fiberglass. You can't blow through foam. My house is foamed, and I can stand in our living room, which is pretty exposed. It's glass all the way around, and we'll have a, I don't know, 15-mile-an-hour wind in the winter, you know, at, at 10 degrees, 
and it is dead calm in there. Yep. And it just makes me feel so good. You know, <laughs> it's like, yes, it's working. Yes, it's working. <laughs> But you've also have done some y- unique projects that if there's how many statues would you say are around the country or around the world that, that you've been involved in? I've probably done not a whole bunch because somebody has to, you know, want it. And a lot of them don't know. A lot of the artists don't know. Um, after doing this, I did go up to Loveland one time and they have a sculpture show in August and I set up a booth there. Uh, it had been going so well, and people seemed to like it. Um, but uh, I've probably done 10 sculptures, uh, maybe more than that, probably 15. And we're not just talking about yard gnomes. <laughs> we're no. talking, you know, how, how many feet tall, what what types? Well, the deal is that what the way they work, these are made out of, um, their base is, is made out of clay, and so they'll get the clay there and they'll carve the lines in it and, you know, put the texture on anything they want, just like it's going to be when it's cast in bronze. Um, everything, you know, they get it just like that's how they want the. Well, the problem is some of these, we did this Jesus that was uh, 16 feet tall and 12 inches wide at the fingertips. Um and the problem with it was it would be so heavy when they got done with this clay that they could hardly work with it. And it used uh, too much clay and it would take more than one batch. And by the time you get into a second batch, it's changed the color a little bit. And then with the difference in color, it would make it harder for the sculptor to, um, to work with. So, this guy had called me up and he said, would you like to try this? And I said, yeah. Um, and so it, he had a very uh, minimal armature. Just, I think there was a four foot diameter uh, pole that went up from the feet to the shoulder. Uh, the arms were one inch uh, tubing. Um, had a little cutout for the head. Um, I don't think it had the hands on it. No, he put that on later on. But it was basically, it was just a real minimal form. And he would stand there, and I was on a scaffolding uh, with my hose and my gun, which put me about a foot and a half away from my surface. So I had an inch, a foot and a half to work with. And so I was right up against it. So I had no depth perception. I couldn't tell where I was or what I was doing. And it was a, it was a team thing. And um, I said, you just tell me what you want. And so he, he had a, a miniature and he would look at his miniature and he had measurements on the miniature and, and measurements on the statue sculpture. A buddy of mine told me, he says, Becker, he says, it's not a statue. You buy statues at Walmart. This is a sculpture, <laughs> you know. So um, anyway, and he would measure it off, and then he, he had a uh, pointer, and he would point to an area, you know, maybe a couple of feet. And he says, now this is going to be the shoulder here. Let's bring that out. Put put." put an inch or so on there and you say there that's pretty good and then we'd come around and put put some on the chest and then we'd build up the robe a little bit and then he wanted a, a wrinkle in the robe where it came across the legs and he said can you do anything like that and my gun was a mechanical gun and i could do a lot of adjustments in it so i would screw the back in which made it come out like a stream instead of a a circle spray and uh it would just go right along there and it made where this wrinkle was in the cloak in his uh robe and and i thought wow that's pretty cool i didn't know i could do that (laughs) and foams like that a bunch of times it's so malleable it makes it's um it's only limited by the imagination and you can accomplish things you didn't know you could. Yeah. And you'd better, but you better know what you're doing before you get started. You couldn't do that in 1976. 
I didn't have the work. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I, I, and the reason I bring up the, the, the you know, the varying number of projects or amount of projects that you did and the, the different types is obviously we, we, as, as foam applicators, we, even if it's just, even if you're just an interior insulator, there's, there's climate conditions, there's structural conditions, there's a number of, of uh, variables that affect how you approach a job. And then if you add in roofing, it's a totally different animal than interior. You're dealing with a different product, you're different, you, you, you know, you probably have a preference of which, which foam gun you're using. Um, but, you know, but then you take it even a step further, which even a lot of experienced foam contractors don't have that you did and, and to help with artistry and to be able to, like you said, add the wrinkle in the cloak or, you know, to build the chest up you're not using the same equipment or the same pressures or the same heats for a statue insulation and a roof. You need to know the differences of what you're using and, and, and whatnot. If could you elaborate on, on how you would go, how you would treat a roof versus what you would do to, to, to perfect a statue? Well, it's, uh, you have to, um, you have to choose your equipment to fit the job. And most people don't even know that all this equipment exists, you know, and it's like a lot of things in life. We get used to what we're used to and stop there a lot of times. And a lot of people don't want to take the, I don't know whether it's effort, but they're not interested in exploring different things. If you're making tons, if you're into it for the money and you're making tons of money um, doing roofs, you know, why change? You got the thing going. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just always interested in it. I remember I was finishing up a job one time and I had to do a whole bunch of kind of free spray sculpting. And which means you build up here that's a little lower and you you can't this and uh, which means slope it. You slope it over here and you fill this low area and um, and I, I get done with it and I'm looking over the job and one of the things with, with foam is texture. Um, foam can get very rough um, and that's not what you want. Uh, when it's going good, it can come out like a sheet of glass. Um, so I'm doing this roof and, and God, it was just, when it's working, it's so good, you know, <laughs> and, um, I, I'm not talking about climaxing and sex, but it's pretty close to that. <laughs> and so I get done with this job and I'm looking at it and I want to change the name of the company to art in foam because it was, I felt like I just painted a, a, a big, a mural, you know, and, um, I mean, it was so smooth. It looked so good. Um, you know, the foam was right. Now for that, we used, uh, I think I used a 2.8 pound and there are different densities. Um, and that usually dictates how hard it is. Um, there will be those people because foam is so malleable. I mean, it's so, you can adjust the formulation on it. And, um, you can have a 2.8 pound foam that's um, uh, used it for mattresses. It's real flexible. It's still dense. In other words, it's got all that material in it. So it's, it has the density of pounds per square cubic foot. And, um, but it doesn't have the, the hardness. And when we're doing a roof, you want it secure you want it you want it to have it, some physical characteristics so choosing these materials um you know and which do you want to use um in the old days they used to use two pound foam which was way too soft we're in the hail belt here and you get a little hailstorm in and then the next thing you know your roof's all beat up um one thing about it is the insurance companies are usually pretty forgiving about that. Um, 
by trying to specify, you know, what products, and then with the with the foam and the the roofing, um, one of the downsides of the urethane foam is it's very UV sensitive. So it has to be protected from the ultraviolet light. If you've ever seen a car seat that's been torn and sat outside for a while, you'll notice that it turns orange and gets gets dusty. Um, and that's the and what it is is that when the urethane is foamed, it's these two it's these two materials, one of which is a foam. Um, that come together under pressure and mix. Um, and so with the high energy UV, what it'll do is break it down and it'll fall apart again. So it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary that it be coated with some ultraviolet protective coating. And because the foam expands and contracts with, let's say summer, winter or whatever, heat and cold, um, this coating has to be elastomeric. Um, everything on a, everything with foam can move. It's all stretchy. One of the qualities of urethane foam is, um, what do you want to call it? Flex or um, elastomeric properties. It, it expands and contracts. And uh, you kind of need to design for that. Mm -hmm. um, so, forty years of experience oh being God, an don't owner and applicator. And, I mean, it's it's something that I I strive for. But I mean, it, it's even something. It's not that, that you were just out selling jobs; you were installing them too. So it's you know, in, in my opinion, it's about as intimate as you could be as a as a, a business owner because you're out there selling it and seeing it through to the end, which is one of the things that I like. Um, but the reason I bring it up is because in 40 years, you've experienced quite a bit. Um, keeping it on, in, in line with, with our current subject today, with the advancements in technology that you've seen since 1976 to, to where it stands today, if somebody's considered not you know, not even considered but somebody knows they want to use foam inside their building let's say uh, a, a metal building or a home and they're out there actively getting bids from contractors from foam contractors and the dollar amounts might might be a little bit higher than their budget or they're having some sticker shock or you know or they're thinking well hell for that price i'll just i'll just buy my own equipment i see i see spray foam equipment for sale online it can't be that hard i just buy it install it and 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 sell it you know and and, and pay a third of what i was being being quoted for what would be your response be to that person i need some power hell this guy over here he's got a nuclear reactor i'll just get that son of a bitch that's what i'm gonna do <laughs> i don't need no uh, nothing else it's scary stuff it's uh, it's under high pressure it's very sticky uh it's one way because it gets on you period it doesn't come off um it can be poisonous. It's a chemical. It's a plastic. Um, you need to have protective respirators or, uh, better yet, fresh air, um, which gives you another hose to drag around with you. Um, but somebody wants to buy their equipment, and I just, my heart goes out to them because there are so many <sighs> bits and pieces to it. And not all of it is obvious. Um, it's 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 like the deal about it's cold out, and um, the foam is temperature sensitive, uh, which means it gets thicker as it gets colder, and then it doesn't spray right, and so you notice it getting thicker, and the um, everybody wants to turn up the temperature. 
and it doesn't rise right when it's cold. It just doesn't. And so it's turning, you know, it's, it's little things like that. And the, the, the equipment, there's a thing they call a crossover. Now, if you run out of one of the materials, because there's an A and a B, which is a resin and a hardener. Uh, either one on its own won't won't do it. But and if you have these on ratio, which in our case is one to one, um, it, that makes it work right. Say you run out of material in one drum. Um, what'll happen is by the time that gets up to your gun, now your pressure's low, and on the other side you've got. I don't know, 1,500 pounds of pressure. And that, instead of coming out the end of the hose, goes into the other side of the hose. And you're holding your gun, and you're pulling the trigger, and you're trying to spray, and you go, God, this isn't working right. What's going on here? You know, go... Go look at that machine and see if you can see so Jimmy, you know, <laughs> get over there. And um, it gets a little wild because it's, and then it finally sinks in. And this is, this is me too, after doing it for years and stuff, because it's just the kind of thing you don't expect. You know, it's like, why is my truck driving bad? Oh, wait a minute. I've got a flat tire. You know, I can't just keep driving it like this or it'll ruin the tire and I'll be stuck here on the road. Um, and it's just like that. You've got to, it's like, oh my God, it's crossed over. And when that happens, everything goes into high gear because the foam sets up in about in eight to 10 seconds. Okay. So you don't have very long to mess with it. A lot of people would say, so you spray this on and then trowel it out. Uh, no, you know, you don't trowel this because it, you it, it stays where you put it. And that can happen with the machine, you know, and, and you get it crossed over and one of the materials going down the other hose and and it's not working. And by the time it hits of what's going on, you know, it's like, holy shit. And everything, shut that machine off. Turn off those pumps. You know, um, do this, do that. Um, and in the meantime, it's setting up in your gun and possibly back in the hose. What's a hose cost nowadays? Too much. Thousand bucks. Easy. Yeah. 1500 a section. So you've just blown $2,000 worth of equipment you know in this one because you ran out because your your pump in the in one side of this skipped it skipped a couple of times <laughs> and and if especially if you're solo um i mean we always wanted to have one person in the truck you know watching it to make sure everything was cool um and that's very important, I think. And and even with even with modern equipment, um, it's just a safety. And you got to remember that safety is no accident. Um, no, that's absolutely right. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I've experienced in the lesson of hard knocks uh, in the life of a foamer is. Uh, well, just as an example, um, one time our pressures were off and we were wondering what, you know, what in the heck was going on to make a very long story short after our philosophy has always been start at the gun, work your way backwards. Yeah. Uh, not always the best method, but in, in most instances it, it helps with the troubleshooting to at least figure out where the hell the issue is. That's probably the part that's going to screw up the quickest. Quickest, right. If we would have stayed true to that in this particular instance, it would have saved us a couple thousand dollars because we, th we were off ratio, pressures were all wanky on the machine, foam wasn't foam, it wasn't making good foam, and took the gun off put a new put a fresh gun on still still have some having some issues and uh we were dead certain that that it was the transfer pump 
in there. So we went to the transfer pump and on our transfer pump, I don't know what your rigs were like, but on our transfer pump, we have a bypass hose essentially so that we could just pump straight from the drum oh, back into Oh, you mean a modern rig. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, it helps when... Yeah, the balance a, of pressure. Well, it helps on the A side uh, that if you use this, this bypass hose to clear it out and not just to let it sit in there because you don't use it very often. Well, whoever used it last very well could have been me. I'm not going to name any names. Didn't clean out that bypass hose. And so that there was hardened a side clogging that particular bypass hose. So we went back to the, 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 the drum and because the, the drum, the, the transfer pump wasn't pushing material through that bypass hose, pump's bad we've got to replace the pump we broke it down we were looking for issues uh long story short had Boy, a, that's a, that is pure reality had a had a backup the 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 good part of it was we ended up having a backup uh uh transfer pump the reality of the situation was that it was a clog on our at the end in our in our whip is there anything in in your mind that uh, uh, sticks out that you learned the hard way in, in your 40 years of experience? Is there anything specifically that you remember? Shit, if I've only would have known that then. Well, like I told you, I was in a class one time from a manufacturer, and there were probably 20, 25 people in there. And he said, hey, you guys, and he pointed at me in the back of the class. And he says, you see the guy back there? Anything that can happen has happened to him. <laughs> so it wasn't exactly that thing, but um, I had a deal. I was in Boulder. Um, I was working by myself, and all of a sudden, the it stops. You know, and I'm getting I'm getting off ratio material. I'm only getting one side. And I'm like, you know, God, what is going on here? And you try to figure it out. Troubleshooting is 90% of the game. Is, you know, when something happens, what's it going to take to fix it? Why is it happening? Uh, you know, and, um, and I found out that I had put the pumps in the wrong material. Oof. I switched the pumps. Now, that is a, just about one of the most rookie <laughs> things you can do. Like I said, I was all alone. It was really hot that day. <laughs> and, you know, I, I kicked my ass off the back of the truck. You know, you stupid ding-dong. Um, and then it, real quick, I had to hurry and try to straighten it up. Uh, one pump froze up. Um you know, it got the material in it, and under pressure, your thing gets really hard. So the chances of resurrecting this pump were almost zero. Now, when you were talking about it and talked about the, um, uh, what was it? The bypass hose? Well, it was a bypass hose, but, oh, you had to fix the pump. You, you figured that it was the pump, you know, and that's... See, and that's the problem with it is that's a very logical uh, thing to assume. Yeah, the, it's not it's, reciprocating. There's yeah, no, we, it's not turning over. It's got to be the pump. Is there something wrong with a pump? Well, a pump is anywhere, I don't know, $1,500, 2000 mm -hmm. Not that this all matters about money. I mean, it does. But most of it goes into how much of a hassle is it going to be? Right, and so the big deal was how how far did this material go up the hose, and and oh my God, did it get into the machine? Right, because then you've got to dismantle the machine, which is not good. Um, that's a professional term, not good. <laughs> um, anyway, you know it's all these little things that can happen, and um, that's why. I always thought it was really good to have someone in the truck, somebody there, and not all the time. You know, if you're just starting out, you got a full set of foam, and you know, and then you know, if you have a problem, you can run back to the truck and troubleshoot it. But um, most of them, uh, I mean, most of the time it works okay. The problem is when it doesn't. And what do you do then? So that's, I always said, you know, one of the big deals is not the spray guy. 
it's the foam mechanic. It's the guy that's keeping it running. It's kind of like you have a, a moving company. And if your truck isn't running, you're dead. Mm -hmm. You know, I know you got some strong arm guys to lift up the furniture and all that. And that's important. But you got to keep the, the truck on the road. Right. And the only guy you can't always call uh, Jim, the mechanic, you know, because he doesn't work on Saturdays. Um, so it helps to know. I had a truck like that. We had it. We were heading up to Wyoming, and it was kind of late in the day. And um, I think it was about seven o'clock at night, and it was probably in October. And we made it about twenty miles, and then the uh, carburetor caught fire, and and the point. Okay, the points were shot too. So I had a spare, this thing burnt eight points like crazy. And so I had a spare set of points and we got in there and I, for this trip, we had a great big job to do up in Wyoming. And for the trip, I brought a guy that was a coordinator. I brought a guy that was a sprayer. I had me, which is pretty versatile. And then I had another guy that was a mechanic. He worked on cars and stuff like that. So I, I figured it was kind of like a mission impossible. I figured we could handle just about any. So the, the auto mechanic got in there, fixed the carburetor, and we got the point set, and we made it. Um, it took us 12 hours. We were pretty tired on the other end. But, um, you know, and, and a lot of it's that way. And I always tell people, you know, they say, well, we need this and stuff. And I say, you know, it isn't what you've got that makes the difference. It's what you do with what you have. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times you get out there and you say, I need this. And you don't have that. So you've got to improvise. So it's a think on your feet thing. That's what I always enjoyed about it. It's very thrilling. Very exciting, especially when you got twenty thousand bucks worth of equipment up against the line on it. Right, that could blow up at any minute. <laughs> yeah, one of the, th the the thing, the thoughts that were coming, you know, that were going through my head while you were uh, answering that question rambling. is, no, not rambling. This is all great information. Um, so, for somebody considering their own equipment to save money they could very easily end up losing a lot more than they anticipated or than, than they would have if they had just paid a professional to do it. And then to take that a step further, not, not just hiring a foamer, but just like in any industry, you got your cream of the crop and you got your run of the mill, you know, fly by night crews and, and paying a premium for an experienced premium contractor can make the difference as well as far as is it going to be properly installed is it going to be done on time under budget because if you have a guy that doesn't have experience and is relatively new to the business that was charging 30 percent less than the experienced contractor and they run into an issue that they've never had before, they're not going to be able to troubleshoot it on the spot or they're not going to, you know, they're, you know, it's they're you're essentially going to be paying for their experience going through that. And, uh, um, that was less of a question and more of a comment. Feel free to elaborate, but it, you know, the difference alone between a contractor that knows what he or she is doing versus a contractor that has no idea what he or she is doing, let alone buying your own equipment and, 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 and running into those issues is a lot of dollar signs. There's a lot of heartache and tears is what it is. Yeah. I've, I ran out of tears a long time ago. <laughs> Real callous. Now. And yeah. And hair. I don't know how you did it. I've only been in the business six years and, and you have a, an amazing head of hair way better than mine. <laughs> is that what counts? That was the you first know thing. Why? That, why? It's all because of the, the uh, quarantine. <laughs> I, it's been growing for the last month and a half. Yeah. And I said, sure, I might as well do it. I had this great picture that I found of Leonardo DiCaprio when he was the uh, when he was up in the north woods and and his hair's uh, I mean it's bad. And uh, I sent that to my kids and my brother and they said, "Oh god, it looks just like you." So that's funny. 
Well, I've used up 45 minutes of your time. Uh, John was... Oh, but I got a lot more. John was very courteous to uh, come down. We're actually recording in my truck outside of a job site that we're on. I'm anxious to to uh, show John our operation and see what he has to think of think of our our install. You know, that last topic there... Sorry to interrupt. No, no, please. But if we're getting close to the end, that last topic there, the... Uh, I mean, I've had so many customers, shit, I'm not going to pay you. I'll just go out and buy my own machine. You know, and I've been through that. It's a, it's a steep learning curve with a lot of possibility. You know, it's like, well, I'll just climb that mountain myself. Well, that's great, buddy. But did you know there's a rock slide up there and the soil's loose? And, you know, you need to know what's going on before... Um, you know, it, it's it, it can be really dangerous, and phone, phone can be really dangerous. But I'm not trying to tell about how, you know, all that. But I'm just saying, I mean, when these people come up and I say, you know, there's a lot more to it yeah. than just buying the machine. And, I mean, you got to operate the machine. And it's not used, it's a lot of times it's not square. It doesn't. It doesn't always make sense. Uh, you need to know about the chemistry. Um, you need to know about pressures. You need to know about air compressors. You need to know about uh, electricity. Either you have a generator or you, you plug in. Um, uh, there's so many different avenues. And I've worked with people, and they said, well, I'm going to go out and buy a machine. And I'm not nasty like that. And I don't, I don't say, go ahead. You'll be calling me next week. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know that that's, I don't know it, but I, you know, I, and I'm kind and I, you know, I'm sorry you're having all these problems, but there are problems associated with the industry mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a tricky material and the way they're selling it nowadays, they make it sound like, oh, she, you just get in there and pull the trigger and money comes out. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. incredible. Yeah. And just watch uh, this Google video or this YouTube video. Yeah. It's, it's not like that. It's a, it's an art. I mean, this stuff is moving all the time. You spray it on and it starts rising instantly and you have to, what I want to say, guess, you have to determine where it's going to rise when you're spraying it. And, uh, you know, you say you're spraying studs in a house, um, that's all well and good. If you don't know how much it's going to rise, you'll tend to either underspray, which will piss the customer off, or overspray, which will piss you off because then you've got to scrape it off and it's tough this is hard stuff and a lot of people will say so you spray it on and then grind it off uh, not not by choice <laughs> you know i have had to do that on a number of jobs i had the guys that went in and they oversprayed the whole job by two inches this guy had some cocaine and got them flying and they just went crazy <laughs> and and then we had to go back in and take it all off, you know. Uh, but it's, you know, it's things like that. And as far as hiring somebody, personally, I'd rather have somebody that's interested and dedicated and intelligent. I don't care so much about the experience. I'll teach them. I, I'm a good teacher. I'll, I'll teach them how to do it. You know, back off a little bit, slow down, and now try to hit this again. And um, I can teach them that stuff. But but they need to be somewhat of a me mechanic so they can figure out what's going on. I can't be standing right next to them all the time. And they need to know what, know what happens when, when the gun sticks open and you can't get it shut off and it's pouring pounds and pounds of foam all over this guy's window and it's filling it up and it's now eight inches thick and he's or he's waving the gun all around he gets freaked out and he waves it over his head and i've seen it um <laughs> anyway yeah there's a lot of experience and well, that go ahead yeah no i i i, I appreciate that because uh, again another thought that co comes into my mind is if if you're dead set on, on buying your own equipment and you don't have any experience you better be dang sure that 
whoever you're purchasing your material or equipment from is willing to stand there with you the entire time to support you through that process. Um, because something's going to happen and, and as, even if it's not quite that bad, even if you're not filling up the window, um, it, uh, it, it's, it could be a huge setback if you don't have the right experience. That's the best observation you could make is to, um, because it's the manufacturer. He's the guy that understands the material. They're the ones that built it. And um, and I get some of these reps, you know, that come in from the manufacturer, and they don't know anything. But if the manufacturer, we were talking about a manufacturer earlier, that had a great, they've got a great technical guy. And I've talked with him over 16 years, and he, it's like he's standing there next to me, and he'll say, is it doing this? I said, well, no, it's doing this. And he says, did you check this? I go, no. He said, you know, check your pressure on, you know, something. And I'm going, God, it's way off. He said, yeah, you need to adjust that. And your screen's, you know, your screen's full of stuff or something like that. Because by this time, troubleshooting this thing, my head is just, I'm gone. It's been hot. You know, I'm right. at my wit's end. And it's that, it's that tech support that makes all the difference. Yeah, that experience and that, that different perspective has has helped us out tremendously yeah. and that's why i appreciate guys like you that are you know you've you've been through the ringer you've come through the other side he laughs you have you still have a fantastic head of hair uh but you're also willing to to talk to us about it and to those that are willing to listen probably at this point it's just uh my mom and dad listening but uh <laughs> You know, I'm sure some sometime down the road, somebody's going to stumble upon this, and they're going to appreciate the things that you have, the input that you that you offered us. So, I appreciate it. Thank you for coming on the show, and I uh, I really hope that you. Uh, well, you I just feel so bad for anybody that gets in the foam business that my heart goes <laughs> out to it. That's not true. And I say I have a bunch of people that call me, you know, and I'm an okay guy. They'll call me and say, you know, and if I don't know, I'll say, you know, I don't know about that. But so and so, they're they're pretty. They got one of those machines. You give them a call, and um, if everybody works together, um, it just makes life so much nicer. And we're not. I was I was saying today that uh, we're not in competition with each other. We're in competition with the guys that are doing other kinds of material. You know, there's a there are competition yeah but we need to you know i told my guys i said when we get done with work and go to the bar um i don't want you guys getting in a fist fight i want you trading stories you know what do you do oh well, we do this really yeah you know and you can learn so much well what's your technique uh, yep yeah. Anyway, trading, trading war stories. I see my rig pulling out right now. So something, they're either all done. No, she's broke. She's broke. It's broke, <laughs> by God. <laughs> Thanks a lot, John. I hope you can okay. come on another time.